Uh, hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. The Cassandra Kane perspective continues. Oh, yeah, you're probably wondering about the glasses. Yeah, things, um, happened recently, and I lost my old ones in a giant chasm I dropped into. Just as well, I hadn't updated my prescription in like 15 years. So anyway, let's talk some more about Cassandra Kane. You can be forgiven for forgetting a lot of what happened, given the schedule slippage that has resulted from History of Power Rangers, or... events at a mansion. And I think all the video footage we took of it looked terrible in low lighting, but... well, the audio still worked at least. So, quick recap. Cassandra Kane, daughter of an assassin who decided to educate her with the language of violence, as opposed to any spoken or written language. Which resulted in some awkward early years when she would kick people whenever she wanted to watch Sesame Street. Actually, the idea was to not expose her to spoken or written language at all. This resulted in someone who can understand you mostly through body language. The slightest movements and twitches allow her to read intention, emotion, etc. She became one of the best fighters in the world thanks to this ability, to the point where Batman speculated that in a straight-up fight, he would not be able to defeat her. However, when her father, David Kane, finally brought her to her first kill as an assassin, she could read what it was like for them at the moment of death, and the body language of it was so terrifying and horrible that she was repulsed by it, and swore to never kill again. During the events of the Batman storyline in No Man's Land, Batman made her the new Batgirl. However, early in her career in her solo book, a metahuman accidentally reordered her brain so she could understand language a bit better, at the loss of her body reading abilities. With the help of the villainous assassin Lady Shiva, her abilities were restored, but but only if she accepted a duel to the death in one year. And they dueled to the death, with Cassandra dying. Which made it a bit weird that there were still another 50 issues of her comic to go. Shiva restored her to life immediately afterwards with a specially trained punch that took that year for her to master specifically for one person, and we learned that Shiva had a death wish, but would only accept her death if it was at the hands of a superior opponent like Cassandra. However, Batgirl defeated her without killing her, and she went on to become best friends with Stephanie Brown, the superheroine spoiler. And after an incident where she stops another assassin named Alpha from blowing up Gotham with the help of a fusion bomb, it's time to see where things will go for the last half of her solo series. So let's dig into Batgirl number 37 to 73 and see if Cass can stay true to herself. At least until other creators screw her up. Issue 37 begins with David Kane escaping his prison cell and leaving a present for Cassandra. It's a knife! No doubt the calling card for some nefarious new villain whose real name is something like Edward Blade or Stephen Knive or something. He did this as a birthday present, though Batman scoffs at the idea that he'd know her birthday, thinking Cassandra was merely adopted by him. His belief is probably based on the fact that Cassandra is half Asian, which means Batman's a little racist? Or maybe he thinks a father wouldn't do this to their own child. I mentioned last time that the series kind of has a running motif, mostly during the original Kelly Puckett run, of people rejecting their villainous or immoral backgrounds in favor of change, reflective of Cassandra herself. 
Issue 37 is the other kind of motif it has running for it. Father issues, as seen by a loving father who kidnaps his daughter to get her away from her uncaring mother who only takes advantage of her profitable artistic skills. It's here where Cassandra realizes that David Kane really is her biological father, especially recalling getting a similar knife as a present when she was very young, and tries to destroy the knife without success. Like, seriously, there's a chainsaw, some swords, a blowtorch. Okay, Cassandra, I know it's a personal, emotional thing to want to destroy this knife, but on the other hand, this thing seems to be made of friggin' adamantium. Might be useful to keep around. Issue 38, while not a direct tie-in to any event, is part of the build-up to something that'd be happening in the Bat books at the time, and another massive Bat crossover, which we'll be getting to soon. Batman tells Cassandra to stop training with Spoiler, that she's off the team and is unreliable and yada yada yada. Batgirl tries to prove otherwise when they work together, but when Stephanie once again disregards instructions and almost blows a plan, Cassandra knocks her out and brings her away, thinking Batman is right about her and their friendship is damaged. Issue 39 begins a story arc for Batgirl that will culminate in issue 50 when she encounters a metahuman named Ty Darshan, or the Black Wind. A terror slash freedom fighter, depending on whom you ask, from the fictional country Tarakstan. He's able to fight her off, and she's a bit taken with him thanks to some compliments he sends her way. It's important to remember that Cassandra never had a normal childhood or teenage years. She's not really used to her hormones or more adult feelings for people, so she's not entirely sure what she's feeling when she encounters something like this. Oracle recognizes this and thinks the solution is to give her some much-needed downtime. And she does that by bringing her on a cruise where she can wear a string bikini. Yes, because obviously Cassandra's idea of relaxing downtime as someone with severe emotional trauma, awkwardness interacting with others, and is very self-conscious given her blossoming adolescence and general fears, is to have her go swimming in a skimpy bikini. Oracle, everybody! The genius whom half the DC Universe relied upon for a decade or two! Also on the cruise is Connor Kent, a.k.a. Superboy, and Cassandra recognizes him. I know they had met somewhere else before, but for the life of me, I can't recall where. Young Justice, maybe? But in any event, she recognizes him. He has a way of moving. I... I recognize it. Of course, if you can read body language, I guess a person's style of movement is kind of like their voice, huh? Well... Yeah, but it might also have something to do with the fact that Superboy doesn't wear a mask. Although isn't it even weirder that Oracle of all people didn't recognize him? Oh, and Barbara finally realizes what a horrible mistake this was because by reading his body language, Cass can tell Superboy's lust for her in the bikini and it makes her feel uncomfortable. I should never have made you wear that damn bikini. Indeed, Babs! But hey, then we wouldn't get album covers like this panel. Anyway, they soon learn that the Black Wind and the guy he was after are on the cruise as well. Babs berates Bruce in a message to him for clearly setting this up so that it's not actually a vacation for her. However, Barbara gets a little revenge by mentioning that Superboy is on the cruise too, the Kents having brought him there as part of a prize they had won. And Batman is pissed about this. Damn it! On one hand, I want to ruin any chance for a normal vacation for her, but on the other hand, I disapprove of a potential romantic interest with a boy. I can't choose what kind of terrible father figure I want to be. For some reason, Superboy is not going by his normal civilian identity of Connor Kent, but instead by a different name. Oh, hi, Carl. Ooh, wait, I see where this is going now. You sunk an entire cruise ship, Carl! Are you sure that was me? I, I would think I would remember something like that. Unfortunately, the Black Wind recognized Cassandra even without her mask and declares that he's going to kill that one guy, claiming it's about justice since they're a war criminal in his country. She and Superboy stop the Black Wind and he's taken into custody and Cass makes out with Superboy, presumably to make the Black Wind jealous, though of course her intentions are unspoken. These issues are okay, but they suffer from not particularly great artwork. I wasn't fond of Damien Scott's pencils, but Adrian Sabar's really pushed the cartoony style more than I prefer, and the coloring feels off. The Superboy thing is further explored in the next issue, when Cass travels to Smallville in the wake of hearing the Black Wind has escaped and returned to Tarakstan. She travels there... by train. Namely by being... 
right on top of it without her mask on. Ow! The dust! It's like being shot in the eyes by a glitter gun! It's a sweet issue, lots of romantic tension, but in the end, they decide to be friends. Really, the larger story point is Cass's growth as a character, being more independent of things that Oracle or Batman would want of her. Weirder in this particular issue, though? They encounter an alien creature, and Cassandra is able to read its body language, too. Not sure how that works, but whatever. It's still cute. In issue 42, Batman and Oracle have a brief argument about Cass's development. Batman pointing out that Cass never wanted to go on that creature Cruise holiday, that it was Barbara's idea, and that she hated it. But Babs counters that Bruce is clearly afraid that if Cass gets a normal life, she may decide she doesn't want anything to do with Bruce and the constant violence. Batman soon learns of her visit to Kansas and assumes Superboy is the one instigating all this. He even tells Superman to rein Connor in. Tell him to stay away from Batgirl. Or else. Just saying, Clark. Accidents happen. Maybe interdimensional refugees from before a crisis happened return, and he dies when a vibrational tuning fork falls on top of him. These things happen, Clark. Superman, of course, doesn't buy into his bullcrap, especially since both are old enough to choose who they want to be friends. In the meantime, Cass and Batman hunt down the manufacturer of a deadly chemical weapon being sold through Gotham named Dr. Death, which is hilariously generic and yet is actually a Golden Age Batman villain. And yet, shockingly, for a Batman villain, his real name is not, like, Dominic DeHeath or something. With their failure to capture Dr. Death, Batman berates Cass for her mistakes lately and tells her not to go to Kansas anymore, and yeesh, the artwork in this one panel. Like, skin tight does not do it justice when it seems like you can see her pupils through it. Anyway, in pursuit of Dr. Death, the next two issues feature her and Batman traveling to Tarakstan. She's further upset about how the government of Tarakstan is very clearly oppressing its people. And Bruce tells her that they're not there to get involved in local politics, just to stop Dr. Death from selling weapons of mass destruction to terrorists. Then again, maybe she's just upset about the fact that her head looks like a potato wedge cut in half. Actually, I take it back. She actually looks kind of like a poor rendition of Coraline. Anyway, they end up being attacked by the Black Wind and his forces, but after getting clear and changing into their work clothes, they learn that the Black Wind is not the one working with Dr. Death but the president of Tarakstan. We see in issue 44 that his weapon is a gas that can transform people into oil, a horrifying chemical weapon, as well as a method of producing something to make them even richer. Oh sure, this kind of thing is insanely useful, probably can turn dead animal or plant matter into oil and get the same results and still be, like, really wealthy, but, you know, why do that when you can be an insane supervillain and sell it as a chemical weapon? Less paperwork. Black Wind tells his origin story as a metahuman, taken by the Soviets years ago and raised by them, but then returning after the Soviet Union fell, only to find his village slaughtered by the Tarakstan government so they could drill for oil under it. We Sakuri have always known not to disturb the dark secrets that lie beneath the soil. Who shall we have one sign the likes of which even God has never seen? They attack the facility where Dr. Death is working, but the Black Wind is killed in the attempt, sacrificing himself to keep innocent people from being subjected to the gas. Cass mourns him, and the entire situation just is contributing to her growing resentment and feelings towards Batman. Issue 45 has Cass talking to Babs a bit about her time as Batgirl, about how different and confident and sexy she felt in the outfit. Something that Cass takes to heart when she borrows the costume and does some crime fighting in it. But it clearly doesn't suit her, no pun intended. More importantly, we learn that there's a new designer drug hitting the streets of Gotham called Soul, which can result in radical mood swings, sometimes blissful and trippy, other times dangerously murderous. Issue 46 has a drug dealer talk about it. That's what Soul does. If you're good, soul makes you feel like an angel. But if you're bad, well, let me put it this way. You ever need to use a porta potty in a crowded place while upside down? 
During a fight with a street gang selling the drug, she accidentally falls into a barrel of soul, swallowing a few of the pills. She hallucinates about all the members of the Bat family, plus Superboy, trying to decide what she wants, berating her, judging her, lusting after her, and even, of course, a shoulder angel and devil trying to convince her to be a good or bad person. And she kind of lets loose, though doesn't kill anybody despite very clearly wanting to. Nightwing stops by to help, but thanks to the drug and the fact that in continuity, Dick and Babs had just broken off their relationship and Babs was hurt about it, Cass just punches him through a window. And much as I like Nightwing, he probably had that coming. In issue 47, after once again showing the straining relationship between Bruce and Cass, we see her watching TV in relation to a murder case and a neurosemiologist who specializes in invented languages and children who offhandedly mentions having encountered Cass before as a child. Obviously not by name, but by her ability to read body language. She meets with him, though it doesn't really result in anything. At least nothing that we didn't already know. But it does highlight an issue that's going to be important for next time. Namely, David Kane abused her. You can try to justify feelings of affection and love for a person however you damn well please. And I've argued with people about this, but rest assured... David Kane abused his own daughter in order to make her a killing machine under his power. And he smiled about it when he talked to a scientist about doing it. It's a point that's also important in regards to Batman's relationship with her. As Oracle keeps pointing out, Bruce really doesn't actually care about easing Batgirl into a life outside of crime fighting. And Cass seems to finally be recognizing that her surrogate father figure that she's made of him is repeating a similar pattern of abuse. Admittedly, Batman is not literally shooting her like David Kane was, so hey, step up there at least, but that's kind of a low bar for a father figure as it is. In issue 48, Batman finally acknowledges to Barbara that she was right. He's been using her just like he uses everybody in his life, and he's doing more harm than good. However, when she starts ignoring orders and refusing to speak to Batman completely, things come to a head. Batgirl tries to stop some human traffickers, and she succeeds. But Batman and Robin had been monitoring the situation and planned to follow them to their base of operations. Their freedom would have come only a few hours later, but they would have also apprehended the larger organization in the process. Cassandra sees it as him just using the victims like he was using her, but Batman just recognizes what he's been doing and relieves her of duty as Batgirl. Cass steals Barbara's old Batsuit and reworks it a bit to create a makeshift one for herself, going out on patrol. We discover that a new version of Soul is out there that just straight up turns you murderous. And of course, Dr. Death is behind it, creating the drug from cadavers. Dude! Gas that turns biological matter into oil! Patent it! You do not need to become a drug dealer who makes drugs from corpses! You are dumb! I thought you specialized in weapons of mass destruction. Well, duh. A drug that turns thousands of innocent partygoers into homicidal maniacs? You don't call that a weapon of mass destruction? Not really. More like a really rowdy bar on a Friday night. You need better hobbies, man. Batgirl tracks him down, but Batman soon arrives, leading us to issue 50 and the big showdown between the two. He orders her to stand down and go home, but she refuses and they begin fighting. Dr. Death, taking advantage of the situation, tosses a new variation of soul at them, and their already exacerbated situation is made worse. Issue 50 is a glorious extra-length fight scene between the two, the soul bringing out their pain and bitterness and frustration and rage. The two are eventually brought to a bridge with some overturned gasoline that Batman ignites. Even though he was under the influence of drugs, I'm still gonna call him Bat Dick for that one. And the two leap over to the water below and embrace. She admits that Kane never really showed affection for her, never let her touch him or hold him in any meaningful way, just fighting and hurting. And when Batman sent her away, he hurt her too. He wants to know once and for all where her loyalties lie in light of everything. To him, to Oracle, to Kane. But no, she's not loyal to any of them. She's loyal to the Bat to the symbol of everything that it stands for. And that's more than enough for him. Bruce even admits to Barbara that he let this fight happen since the two of them needed it. It's the only kind of therapy Cassandra would understand. 
fighting is her entire language, and it worked out, and she's back in action as Batgirl. Which, once again, makes the events that would happen later even stupider. But we'll get to that! After a two-parter where Batgirl takes on Poison Ivy, we once again resume the friendship between Cass and Stephanie Brown, wherein she's taken over for Tim Drake as Robin. Long story there, but it's part of the lead-up to that event I mentioned earlier. War Games. We'll get back to that in a bit, but once again we have a bad Oracle moment. Though this one is at least a little more understandable. Long story short, Cass is fighting a murderous robot, and there's a code word to make the robot self-destruct. Unfortunately, the woman who is helping Cass read it gets knocked out, and thus she can't read the word. She tries to describe the letters to Oracle, but she's in a panic mode, and thus exclaims, You're kidding! You still don't even know the damn alphabet? All those hours spent practicing martial arts, and you can't spare the time to learn your ABCs? For God's sake, Cassie, how stupid can you be? Yeah, even in a heat of the moment kind of thing, it's not like she's unaware of Cassandra's history, and it puts a major strain on their relationship for the rest of the book's run. In restless dreams I walked alone Narrow streets of... 